Public Assembly Police and hashtag child protection. Um, first of all, any apologies for absence? Apology for absence has been received from Assembly Member Ishalomi. Okay, thank you very much. Um, declaration of interest as ever, can I ask the committee to note the recommendation in item two and ask members to declare any other disclosable interests that they have not detailed within the Assembly records. Thank you very much for that. Item three, can I ask the committee to confirm the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on 1st of November to be signed by me as a correct record? Happy with that. Item four, can I ask the committee to note the complete and ongoing actions arising from previous meetings of the committee as listed in the report? Thank you. Item 5, action under delegated authority. Can I ask the committee to note the recent action taken by me following consultation <coughs> to agree a letter to the Mayor regarding football violence and security of Olympic Park and to note the letter from the Chairman is attached as Appendix 1 to the report. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Thank you for waiting through that. Um, we're now to the main part of the meeting, which is child protection in London. Can I welcome very much our illustrious guest this morning, uh, Gwen Kennedy, Director of Nursing South London and Regional Lead for Safeguarding in London. Thank you very much. Um, we, we have Detective Superintendent Stephen Chandler and probably his boss, Commander Richard Smith from the Met. Welcome, gentlemen, this morning. David Beard, Head of Corporate Safeguarding Bernardo's. Um, Angela Harris, Regional Manager, St Christopher's Fellowship. Thank you. I think I've got that right. Um, we've had apologies from one guest this morning um, from Islington who will be writing to us with, with evidence and that will be absolutely perfect. So thank you very much, um, guests, for coming along to this morning's meeting. This is a year on uh, and a bit since the HMIC uh, report about the fundamental deficiencies in the way the Met understands and responds to child abuse and sexual exploitation. This committee busied itself with this subject a year ago uh, with two meetings. Uh, at the last meeting was with AC Martin Hewitt, who was named and is the um, responsibility, the Met lead responsibility in this area. And it's absolutely right that a year on we pursue it further. Since then, there's been three interim HMIC reports one of them only a week ago. So we'll ask some questions in, in that sort of context, colleagues, if you're happy. So I'll have the first question, if I may. So this is to, to everybody. Uh, a broad question is, what is the nature and scale of childhood vulnerability in London today? Anybody to, can, can answer, in whatever order you see fit. Um, shall I start? Yes, Gwen. <laughs> can people hear me all right? Yes, yeah, we'll let you know. Um, yes. That there, are, there are a wide range of vulnerabilities for children in London, and they range really from the mental health of young people, um, our um, young people with suicide rates, along with our looked after children, and, and that includes our unaccompanied asylum seekers' children, the health needs and the vulnerabilities of those children. There is also a wide range of um, um, issues around gangs um, and gangs and youth violence as well, which is um, 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 well known and reported in, in the media. And um, also wider vulnerabilities in respect of um, um, the prevent agenda and also, which is um, obviously um, preventing radicalisation and also um, in respect of our um, female genital mutilation, domestic violence um, um, agenda. So there's a wide range of vulnerabilities which impact on um, um, children's health and well-being, and whether they're caused by adult mental health issues or by children's mental issues. So um, the platform for safeguarding and children and, and the importance of needing to work as a partnership is, is really um, 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 there. So it's broader in range than, than in the past that you've seen in the past, but also larger in scale by nature of It's that. larger in scale and it's, it's growing because we have <coughs> other headlines um, where we're becoming more aware of modern slavery yes. and the, 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 the impact of that on children. Um, and there are some hidden, um, hidden vulnerabilities which we are just um, really beginning to fully understand that as well as obviously child sexual exploitation and, and, and how, we, how we manage those broader, um, broader headlines and a lot of work sits underneath those but th there are key, vulner there are key <coughs> issues for London, for London children as well as for national children. Yeah. And that's what we'll be trying to tease out is about 
how London is, is, is exceptional in, in, in this area, which I think, as it often is in many areas, unfortunately, probably in this one. Would other colleagues like to ask, answer that broad question? Yeah, <clears throat> I think I would, I would echo some, um, quite a bit of what Gwen has said about the, the range of threats affecting these children, but also the fact that a lot of them are interlinked. So the cohort of children who go missing most regularly, um, a large proportion of those may be at risk of either criminal exploitation through what we now call county lines, a form of modern slavery for them, um, or child sexual exploitation. You know, there, we are now starting to recognise more of the links there, but also those links into the, the health-based issues, mental health in particular, and then linking back into other areas of crime, we can see the link between childhood mental health and the experience of domestic abuse in the home. <clears throat> There's some work uh, in, that the Welsh constabularies have done and have been sponsored to take forward around adverse childhood experiences, the link between domestic, um, <coughs> domestic abuse in the home and then future involvement in such things as abuse of alcohol or um, in our world being involved in violent offending, gang offending, etc. So we are now seeing a lot more of the links, but that's not to say that any given child will be affected by all of these, but very often those who are most troubled um, are affected by a range of complex needs, both in terms of social care, health and policing, <coughs> which makes the partnerships that we've got absolutely key to delivery. Thank you. I think also the geographic boundaries have changed. We're now de dealing with a digital threat as well, which a lot of children in London and the UK uh, face. So whereas before we may speak in wards, in boroughs, if we're out in the counties, in county policing uh, now, very much it's cyber. the cyberspace mm. is a threat. Mm. Yeah. And that is a real vehicle for, for some of this vulnerability and threat. So previously it had been more of a geographic aspect but now evolving <coughs> over the last 10 or 20 years that there's the county lines issue but also the, yeah. the the internet issue in that aspect the virtual sure. threat is but the is, virtual is, threat is there, yeah. is there which we wouldn't have seen before uh, Angela, do you want to comment? Uh, just, just to support what my colleagues have said, um, we're a provider of services for mm. looked after children, <coughs> homeless young people and care leavers um, in London and we work with 29 of the London boroughs um, and the most significant concern for us is around missing young people and how that links in with CSE and mm. with um, gang affiliation. Um, but also very much impacted by underlying mental health issues. Okay, thanks. Hey, hold, David? I mean, not a lot to add to that. Okay. I don't think just going over the same ground, which I don't, okay, intend, thank you. don't intend to do. <coughs> if, I'm, if, if I may, um, just, just one point. There was a mention of, of starting to understand more of, of this hidden harm. And I, and I think we talk a lot about the increasing demand on all our services. Some of that does come from harm that has already always been there, that we're now starting to understand more of. And some of that's about the confidence of people coming forward. Some of that is about broadening the public debate so that people are identifying child sexual exploitation where a few years ago that was, that was pretty much um, unrecognised. So some of it is, is hidden harm that we're now finding, but some of it is genuinely new. And I think the online threats where we've seen a seven-fold increase in the number of referrals we've had around indecent images of children since 2014. That is, that is definitely uh, an increasing uh, <coughs> demand on us, not just discovering something hidden that's new. This really, and it's leading into my next question. Now, we will have some detailed questions about, about the changes in the Met and also the, the Wood Review, which is changing about how partnership working is evolving. We'll have some questions around that later, but you, you've touched upon something I wanted to talk about, those, those main challenges that partners are facing in this, in this new terrain. Can you give us some high-level detail about these new challenges that you've partly touched upon that you find yourselves or we find ourselves in at the moment? So one, of, one of the challenges around is around children's mental health and how um, in the safeguarding um, arena, whether, whether there are children that are vulnerable to child sexual exploitation or looked after children, is um, access into mental health services. So um, I know across the country, and from a health perspective, we are looking at um, investment in CAM services, childhood adolescent mental health services, mm. uh, with, a, with a view to ensuring that, that we're increasing access to um, mental health services to support um, children that um, at 
that before they, 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 they need what we call tier four services, which are the more, the more like inpatient bed services. So we're, we're looking at um, tr transforming CAM services so that there is better access for children mm. and, and working with our partner agencies to ensure that CAMS workers are embedded mm. in services um, outside of the, tr the traditional mental health services. So that's one way of supporting um, 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 children, vulnerable children from a systemic um, perspective. Um, you may wish to comment on the, on the, on the uh, at a high level, the effectiveness at the moment. You, you mentioned partnership working, but you might like to reflect on, on the challenges around the effectiveness that we will talk about in some detail earlier. Particular challenges, David, did you want to comment at all? So I think there's a, a real issue around rising thresholds, in, um, particularly in social care environments. Um, the, um, the, the Children in England um, report that was done earlier in the year, which was called Beneath the Threshold, I think raised some very interesting points about right that kind of gap, that middle gap in the market, the, 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 the statutory threshold is undoubtedly increased and is increasing all the time in terms of how um, access to statutory support, provision, um, investigation if necessary can, can occur. Um, the lower level of, of services um, in the preventative field uh, are, are clearly struggling against an impact of, of financial uh, austerity, etc. And then there's that whole kind of middle group of children and young people and families who are who are struggling previously in, in, in better times to have access more community based resources in order to support them <coughs> and increasingly those have dis disappeared and are dissipating over the period. I think the other problem and I think it's it's a London issue, it's probably a, a much wider issue as well, but I mean the importance of working with the young people, the importance of partnerships is the is the is the relationships that are formed. So yeah, positive work with children and young people is all about developing a positive relationship by whoever that is with that individual child and young person. The same very much um, relates to how effective partnership working, changing personnel and changing structures doesn't help that and obviously we'll touch on that later I'm sure. Yeah, okay. Your point about threshold so I can understand as you're saying is because of the, the increase in serious cases shall we say, resources and thresholds are moving up there and that's increasing that that medium risk gap yes. uh, and, and, and there's less resource to attend to that to that kind of yeah. Yeah. that 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 segment and, and for those sorry and for those of us who are obviously service providers it's that it's that it's where the commissioning world then yeah. fits into that middle gap that's that's critical and capacity sorry, Angela, I, yeah. I think that's right because often um, when children young people do meet the threshold it might be around something significant like gang affiliation or child sexual exploitation and, and they um, become cared for um, within our organizations but what we find is actually that's the presenting issue and what's underneath is years of neglect and abuse um, and they're the issues actually that we, we're working with um, without uh, without obviously ignoring the, the the presenting huge challenges that, that we have um, which does link into thresholds it links into resources it certainly links into mental health resources for young people okay thank you very much um, that leads me to my next question which clearly we're reflecting on the report that the, the Met had uh, a year a year plus ago and, and it's this is something that we are particularly concentrating we've got some questions around that in a minute particularly, but my, my question, my last question really is to non-MET colleagues, and I hope you understand that, is about the relationship between the police and professional agencies at a local level across London as we find ourselves now, and I'll ask our three colleagues on that and you'll, you'll have the opportunity to, to respond later. So, relationship at the moment and over the last year or so, reflection on that between the MET and the work that you do and, and within the boroughs, although we haven't got the borough here. Would you like to comment at all, colleagues? Yeah, well, I am. Um, I, I, I to be as polite as impolite as you. I took people. advice of my colleagues who work directly um, with oh, colleagues no. across London. No, so, no, so none right. of this is, a, is, 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 uns is solicited or unsolicited, whichever it is. I mean, the response was that actually local level arrangements with the police are increasingly positive. Um, um, a, a, a certainly, a very positive approach to recognising some of the things that we've already been talking around and a multi-agency working particularly around um, um, CSE, very positive approach to training and training that's offered to them around a range of issues, CSE, FGM, as we've already mentioned. Um, some extremely effective working around the MASH teams, the uh, <coughs> CSE Asian terms, in terms of that integrated service delivery, which is ex extremely positive and I think is a, is a cross-borough initiative as well. Um, and a real openness to co-working. So, um, um, 
the, there was a recognition of the challenges in which the, um, in which the police are, are working as well, particularly around those young people who are on the fringe and who are always difficult to engage with, um, etc. But um, actually, extremely positive picture was what I, what I established. Okay. I, 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 would, I would actually support that. Um, the feedback that I've had and my experience is that on the whole it's been very positive and certainly some really good recent developments around local protocols. Um, many of our, the managers of our services sit on the, um, the MACE panels, multi-agency mm -hmm. multi sexual exploitation panels, and they're really helpful forums in terms of developing working together practice and agreeing local protocols. And some of those aren't just about protocols, they're sometimes about some really practical solutions um, an example, we, uh, we've had CCTV fitted in the street outside the home of our home, which is specifically for girls at risk of CSE, um, to capture intelligence. Um, we have um, named professional contacts, particularly from the CSE and missing, and they come and do some training with the staff teams, and they're the things that are particularly effective for our our staff. We, we have had some examples, but they tend to be very much of poor practice, but they tend to be very much on an individual level. And whenever we've addressed it, we've felt that, that they, they've been dealt with appropriately. So our experience overall has been fairly positive, and we see a bit of an improving picture. An improving picture. That's good. Yeah. Gwen? Yes, not wanting to repeat what's been said, but I think in addition to that, well, I think what's been really helpful, I think particularly during this last sort of 12 to 18 months, is the, is the different levels that the police are engaging. They're, very, they're engaged at a really senior level across, across the system, and they, we now have a, um, a contact where we can escalate. So the escalation lines within the police are much clearer, and that's really helpful. But also um, at, um, at sort of um, different tiers within sort of the health and partnership arena, we have got the police representation on our key um, partnership boards and committees, particularly on <coughs> crime work, and the engagement there has been really, really positive, and it's been really helpful about uh, shaping, uh, again, commissioning decisions, that, that, that influencing and that, that input has been really, really positive. So I think that it's a, it's a layer of, of engagement that the police are working at, which is, which is enhancing partnership um, working. Susan, did you want to ask a question? Yes, actually. Can I ask the gentleman from the police? I, having spent... Uh, the multi-agency work is the way forward. It's just incredible. And I spent hours with the police in multi-agency. And the one thing that always came up, and it came up again yesterday in the education meeting, the data sharing from the national health departments. That has always been an issue, or always was when I was. And it was brought up yesterday that um, there are issues sometimes getting CAMS to... Um, share data. Can you tell me, is that still the case or has that, has that been changed now? Um, <coughs> in, you, you're right to say that information sharing is a, um, a dominating issue around the multi-agency safeguarding arena. Um, I think the direction of travel has been in the right direction for the last few years. We are getting better at it collectively. Um, but it is very difficult and particularly for health colleagues within the current legal framework, uh, I think there's a, there's a certain appetite for risk that is required around sharing sensitive confidential data. And there are different cultures on the, on, in the various agencies about what we're prepared to share and how we interpret the information that we have as to what needs to be shared and what doesn't. But I do think uh, that the direction of travel overall is positive um, within the legal framework that we have, which has got a lot of checks and balances for very good reasons around protecting people's data, but it, it does mean it's not as simple as we just want to share our data <coughs> and we can have all of it. It isn't like that. Any, any move forward to make it easier, we would certainly welcome, and I'm sure colleagues in health would feel the same. Okay, well, I think we should take that away because that is the one thing that we, we keep coming. Certainly, having been involved so much, that is the one thing that's been a major problem. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. So our next set of questions is now to look at and address how, how the Met has looked at itself over the last year in response to the report. Len, you've got some questions. Well, let's start. So we're focusing on the police performance, and we're going to take you back to the HMIC report before in 2016, which I presume um, some of the changes that arose out of the local protocols come at that particular time in your response to that report. Okay. Um, in terms of just reminding ourselves, 
of that report, uh, it was pretty damning. I think it's fair to say, agree with that. It? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? I think we would agree with that. Right, okay. So you agree with the, the comments of fundamental deficiencies, that there was a bit about attitude or stroke culture at the Met, <coughs> understanding response to child abuse, sexual exploitation, and that it was putting children at London at risk. So in that last year then, tell us what you've been doing and what's different and then I'm going to just focus you back on some more. So what's different? I, I think um, taking us back then, there were, there were the criticisms that were in that report, which we agree with, um, come down to an element around the capability of the staff that we had, both in specialist roles, but also more generally, because safeguarding children is everybody's business but the complexity of the Met perhaps led some areas to feel that somebody else was doing that. So there was not just a capability issue, but a cultural issue of whether or not it was a priority for everyone or just for particular people. Um, underpinning that, there were some capacity issues around certain crime types and the, and the amount of resource we were able to bring to bear against them. And I think also for some staff, just the, the confidence in knowing how to engage effectively with partners. Um, it, so the, the capability and the confidence bit went hand in hand. Um, we are a very big organisation. The way that we were structured was commented upon by HMIC, the lack of a chief officer with responsibility for child safeguarding throughout the organisation. Um, they found it to be quite piecemeal. Um, one of, a tangible example of our reaction to that criticism is, is my role. So my role was created directly as a result of that. Um, we have dedicated 50% of our uh, professional development days for our frontline training to child protection this year. And, and uh, committee members may think, well, only 50% after such a damning report. But when you look at the broad spread of delivery the Met has, that's a huge proportion of our, our main training effort for the frontline has been on this subject, and it won't stop. We've developed... Um, bespoke training courses, both for specialists and frontline, so a new five-day course for missing persons investigators to understand the links that we've already articulated between missing children, county lines, um, CSE, and so on. Um, so it's been around delivery of more and better training, a shift in culture to make everybody understand this is our business. Um, it's been the first properly coordinated internal communications campaign that the Met has run, the Spot It, Stop It campaign, which uh, we will evaluate early in next year, but all the feedback is that that has been successful and HMIC have, have seen that. Um, and a change in the strategic governance of safeguarding to appoint lead responsible officers for the various strands of work that sit within my portfolio, again, which we didn't have before. Um, we are better now at our own internal assurance processes. One of the stark outcomes of the initial report was that the cases that the Met had assessed as being adequate were not. We've, um, we have now got ourselves into a position where our internal assurance matches that of HMIC, so they're in agreement on our assessment. Where we haven't delivered the shift that we really wanted is in the final outcomes for children, better outcomes for children in London. That's still not showing a substantial increase, um, and that is what our current focus will be on. We've put the strategy in place, we've done training, we'll continue with those, but it has to now be frontline delivery that shifts. We're told that MOPAC uh, sees this as a priority and is overseeing this work, just approximately. So. Um, What's the interaction between yourselves and MOPAC, you know, um, the foot on the back of your neck, making sure that you're on top of this? So what, how does it work? Do you uh, paint uh, us a picture of that relationship that you have with MOPAC, you know, in the oversight of this work? Is it regular? Is it monthly meetings? I, Is it I'd weekly say meetings? I, I feel that in my role fairly keenly. Yeah. Um, the personal attention from the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime is absolutely clear to me um, and one of my earlier meetings in this role was a one-to-one -one, um, with the Deputy Mayor to discuss this subject. The oversight group which is due to sit early, in fact next week, 
um, is the main vehicle for examining our progress on this and, and to apply that pressure. Uh, I, would, I would say certainly I feel that scrutiny very keenly in the role that I've got. Okay, and who's, who's the membership of the oversight group, just yeah. for the record? <coughs> I'm, I'm sure they have that on record here. It's chaired by the Deputy Mayor. I haven't been to one, and, and the only occasion I've been to one where the Deputy Mayor wasn't chairing, it was chaired by the Chief Executive. Okay, so well, maybe we'll pick, we'll pick that up outside this meeting. Let's roll forward then to near time then. So we're making some progress, all right? I think that. So let's look at the third quarter of HMIC's reporting to you. How do you feel about that then? I think I would... I would echo some of the comments I've, I've already made, that there's a recognition of how our strategy or strategic approach um, has changed for the better, and any kind of frontline delivery that we attempted without putting the right strategy in place, I think, would have been unsustainable and short-lived, and I'm pleased that that's been recognised, um, but we... I share the concerns that are expressed in that, that we are not yet seeing okay. the shift that we want in the frontline delivery for children. Okay, so what's the tactics that are changing to shift it? So in light of this, okay. so, you know, bearing you, look, that's the only way, I'm a great believer in self-improvement, all right, and the only way is to confront the reality, the stark reality of the police performance in this area. So let's say this, so the HMRSI, say uh, actually your the progress is being made they don't expect progress to be made overnight but they pulled uh, 135 cases that in terms of your um which is a good bit for you so in terms of, of those 135 three your false assessment said three were good they reckon 10 were good Requiring improvement, you said at 84, they said 64. So, um, you know, there are some interesting signs there. But inadequate, you add 48, they add 61. But they say, and I thought in terms of their percentage, percentage figures, um, just under 93% demonstrated police in practice even need, needed improvement or was inadequate. So, you add the 2016 report, you now got this one on your desk. You're waiting for your review next year. Hmm. What are you going to change now? Or are you going to wait for your review next year? So, uh, yeah, you asked what the step change is um, and what I did when I received that report. Last year, when the report arrived, a gold group was set up, uh, chaired by a senior officer, bringing together representatives both from inside and outside the Met to deliver some of the strategic change, the pan-London change, differences in the way calls are handled, training and so on. And that has continued to date. The arrival of that report indicates that the strategic, the pan-London is starting to show some areas of improvement, but the frontline delivery is not. That frontline delivery is at borough level or BCU level where amalgamations have been made. So what I have done is the Gold Group meeting that I've described will continue, albeit more frequently now, so it will be every four weeks, and the first one of those is in two weeks' time. But in addition to that, there is a parallel meeting with representatives of the frontline local delivery at, at senior leadership team level, so chief inspector, superintendent level, for each of the geographic areas of London. The first of those meetings was two weeks ago, and they also happen every four weeks, so in between the others. That's where those individuals will be held to account for their own local delivery around the range of child safeguarding issues and measures that we look at, so missing and CSE, indecent images of children, child abuse, and so on. <coughs> um, that's the difference. Running in parallel to that, we have the dedicated inspection team, whose results you just referred to, conducting audits on our work Previously, those audits were done in support of the HMIC quarterly inspections. Going forward through 2018, and this is the plan that I've taken to the Deputy Mayor of that Oversight Group to explain what we're doing, the audits will be uh, split in half, so thematic audits will continue regardless of whether HMIC stay with us or not, on the nine different subjects that they examined across the whole of the Met, 
and the other half of the team will effectively be camped out in those regions that are outliers for the wrong reasons. So the areas of, of the Met where we found most improvement was required and they will go in a month at a time to do a deep dive into those areas and report those findings back to me at that other meeting and also into the Deputy Mayor's Oversight Group. That's the difference for this year going forward directly as a result of what we're seeing from those quarterly inspections and as a response of where we're seeing improvement and where we're not. But can I just say, in terms of those people you've identified at that level, on the senior level, I think we've got a far wider problem in the Met if you're going down and want to encourage a culture that everyone's making a contribution to this. Shouldn't you want to bring in BCU commanders as they currently exist now and say, actually, what are you doing to make a contribution to this? Because, you know, HMS side, we found very little evidence that senior leaders, and I recognise leaders can be at different parts of the organisation and the interface with your partners in doing this work, uh, um, in the MPS, using um, this information change, I found little evidence that they were using the information to change operational practices <coughs> sufficiently to bring about demonstra demonstrable improvements in the provision of child protection service. We've got a bit of a wider problem than those immediate people that you've identified to bring them in and say, hold on, what's going on, guys and girls, in terms of this service? What, you know, in terms of that, where, what's the thinking in the Met about the rest of the team <coughs> coming to play in that wider leadership <coughs> level? Well, you're quite right to say this is everybody's business, um, and you're also quite right to say the but BCU... You tell me it's everyone's business, <coughs> that's because that's what your stance tells me in the reports. You oh. say that, that's, what you, okay. that's your new way of working, that everyone's going to take a bit of a role in this and step up to in terms of protecting children in London. Yeah, so, um, okay, so this is everybody's business, and you are quite right to say the BCU commanders should have a role in this. Um, and perhaps when I articulated the new governance regime around delivery, I perhaps didn't, I wasn't clear enough on exactly where those people have been drawn from, who they represent, and there is another element to this as well, which um, I hope will assist. So those individuals have been selected by the BCU commanders to represent them at, their meet, at this meeting and to deliver on their behalf, which is why they're drawn from the senior leadership teams. One of the areas that they will be measured on is what they are doing around shifting culture, the practical measures they're putting in place in terms of their local leadership. So that is how they are using the Spot It, Stop It campaign locally, how they're expanding the impact of it, what reward and recognition processes they're putting in for good safeguarding behaviours, so not just holding people to account through compliance when things go wrong, but also rewarding those people who do excellent work around child protection and other safeguarding. And we do have fantastic police officers and fantastic police staff who do that and should be recognised for their work. Um, the BCU commanders, though, as well as sending a representative to my meeting, are also held to account robustly through the crime fighters process. My agreement um, with Martin Hewitt, who I report to on safeguarding, is that in every monthly crime fighters meeting, I have a significant proportion of the agenda. I have at least two distinct safeguarding subjects to hold the BCU commanders to account for. And of course, that links across into the other meeting. So both the senior leadership team representatives who are coming and representing those geographic areas and their bosses at BCU level are being held to account not just on quantifiable performance delivery but also qualitative audits conducted by the dedicated inspection team and what that's showing us and also the local shifts in culture and what they're doing proactively to move that. So all of the things that you've described. But some of the things that I've identified in this third quarter of the report are pretty basic. Lack of record keeping, lack of supervision, lack of... I mean, it's interesting you say about the training. They recognise that you're moving on training, but there's still issues around training, around the skills audit for investigations. We know, in terms of the outcomes of anyone who's worked on child protection around this table, 
And of course, we know the pressures the police are under. Do not underestimate this is a bit of police bashing on our part. This is a bit of tough love I'm giving you here in terms of uh, actually making sure we're on top of it. What, so let's go back. I think I asked you again, but I'm not clear. What, in terms of when this report arrived on your desk, have we changed or have considered changing of stepping up from where you've started off from the 2016 report, saying, actually, hmm, this is not going according to plan. It's moving in the right direction, but it's not going fast enough. Because I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to quote a case, because not going against whatever you're saying, I think we need to understand the lack of progress even though there is some progress, of what it means. So a 15-year-old girl who was a looked-after child at the time of an incident had been reported missing. She was found at an address of a registered sex offender, numerous other children, all known to the Children's Social Care Services, and at risk and other sexual exploitation were also present. Children's Social Care Services requested two strategy me meetings in relation to the CSE concerns. But the force did not attend to share relevant information or contribute to the safety plans for those at risk. There are no records of any discussion with the management of the residential unit where the RSO <coughs> resided to, to discuss wider safeguarding issues, even though the investigating officer had noted the action needed to be taken in to, pre to prevent female children visiting the unit. On the 19th of July, 2017, the MPS audit highlighted these failures. So your own audit did this. By the 14th of August, 2017, when the HMIC people were in reviewing the case, there had been no documented response to the recommendations made by the MPS. The case was referred back to the force. That's pretty basic stuff that still is happening and if we go back to the original uh, sort of per, you know percentage figure of what hmi is saying that's very damning of where we are what can we do to accelerate the process that you're trying to achieve and put your endeavors into to get us into a better place i i don't disagree that a case like that is damning um, and, I, and I think I was really clear about that at the start. It is that focus on frontline delivery that we are concentrating on, as well as all the other things that I've articulated. Um, so that report is what has caused this shift into very much more around the front line, into holding to account. You um, described there where those findings went back to the investigating area and nothing was done. Um, my framework that I've described to you is where people would be really robustly held to account if that happened again. Um, in discussions with Steve, who runs the audit unit, um, he is clear that people now do respond quicker. Um, the vast majority of the units that we're inspecting now understand this and respond to it because of our new focus on it. We are doing all of the things that we can and responding to all the recommendations in there, but you're quite right, we, we have a range of challenges in policing this really complex city, but it is not from lack of effort, lack of attention, or lack of thought. Um, this is a really tough ask for us, but we are, doing, we are responding to the reports and putting all the measures in place that we can in order to shift the frontline delivery and get to a point that we all want, where we are delivering the best possible services for these children who are immensely challenged and immensely challenging um, to try and assist. Many of the people we want to help do not want to engage with us at all. I think if we looked at our performance a few years ago, where there was no specific allegation of crime, our remit would have ended there. We very much don't see that anymore. We are looking at all the opportunities to intervene early, to work preventatively. Two thirds of our CSE investigations on our system as crime reports, a full two-thirds of those have no criminal allegation within them whatsoever. It's a suggestion that the young person concerned may be at risk, and we investigate those as rigorously as we would if it was a crime, because we recognise that waiting until we have a substantive crime is too late. It's at the acute end. 
So I do think our direction of travel is the right one. I don't underestimate the scale of the challenge and the fact that that case mm. happened this year Not illustrates today. how difficult this is going to be. But I firmly believe that we'll get there and I do believe we have the right people to do it at every level of the organisation. And I'm really heartened by the feedback we had from partners around the room to say that those relationships are getting to a much better place. Okay. Um, let's then go back on terms of um, the issue of let's concentrate on the future. Right. Okay, so the, uh, the embedded safeguarding in neighbourhood policing approach and where <coughs> in particular are you in terms of what work's taking place in the pathfinders on the merged areas? What's different? Um, surely I should be seeing some performance issues that are different from other the, the borough BCUs. Is that correct or not correct? Where, where are you? Um, we're, we're waiting for the final evaluation on safeguarding within the BCUs. The two BCUs, I'm, I'm sure the committee are aware, are very different, deliberately different in nature. So one is a combination of three London boroughs, one is two. One of them is in um, outer London, one is inner London. So they have different policing <coughs> challenges and structures. So you would expect some difference across them, deliberately so. But we're waiting for the final evaluation. Some of the early indications on the safeguarding side that we're seeing are positive. So, for example, in the East Area, the East Area, you mentioned earlier about um, attendance at strategy meetings, multi-agency strategy meetings. The attendance in the BCUs and East Area in particular is above the London average. We're managing that better. The reason for that, I believe, is the co-location of officers who are in child abuse investigation teams with the MASHs. We know the MASH setup works well for multi-agency working. We know that if you co-locate people from different um, agencies in the same geography, in the same building, that's effective. Having our specialist officers in there as well has eliminated that artificial barrier that we previously had and has meant that we can have the right officers in the right discussions much more frequently and much more quickly. So that's a success. We also see in the, um, in the delivery end of our business some advantages in combining those officers Previously, domestic abuse, a huge driver for a lot of the harm in young people, was investigated <coughs> locally, whilst child abuse and uh, rape offences were investigated in specialist units in a different business group. And yet, we know that certainly at the more serious end of domestic abuse, a huge number of women who are affected by domestic abuse are also subject to sexual offending Previously, those, those women would be having to deal with potentially two different investigating officers working in two different structures and not able to readily talk to each other. In the BCU model, that is all brought into one place so that officers investigating really troubled families where there is domestic abuse and sexual abuse and child abuse going on at the same time or even just a child at risk, then there is a single structure in one place where those are brought together and the right discussions to be had. And that's where we're seeing the advantage, and that's why the safeguarding model looks like that on a BCU. OK, and so internally the police are doing the review. In the nature of your work is about partnership working. What's a role of partners going to have in that review of these new Pathfinder areas so we can get to see their view and their, you know, their take on what, what's happened in terms of the new way of working? Um, I'm, I'll be cautious about commenting on behalf of partners, particularly those who are not here. It's, a, um, it, it's unfortunate that I think we were going to have a representative from Islington. I think it would have been really helpful mm. to hear their views on, on how this has worked for them locally. I think um, if I may limit myself to saying that some of our uh, key stakeholders in local partnerships were concerned and cautious about the way this may work. And I think the majority of them would now say that they can see some of the benefits that I've just articulated. So I think but I won't this, speak. This committee have been raising issues of one of the issues about merged boroughs is about this nature of this work. Um, and so we've been raising some of our issues, thinking where does this fit in? How is it going to look? <coughs> um, OK, so on that... So, uh, I think, Chair, we need to follow up and find out where officially 
are we talking for partners to have a view on the internal review that the Met are doing um, around this piece of work? So if we could do that. Um, I would have asked questions of Carmel about those issues. If I can just um, just go, go back on, in terms of accelerators, right, if you had a wish list of what, what would accelerate you from getting to A to C, what area would you focus on of getting that, that cultural, cultural attitudinal change around the professional officers who, try, who think they're doing the right job but maybe not doing it in the way that we need it done to meet the demands of the you know, meet the challenges that we face. What would you do? What, what area would you focus on? I think there is a there is a fundamental link between our ability to deliver really strongly in such a complex area and the capacity and resources that we have to do so. In an ideal world, we would be able to shift um, significant resource into this area, but we do so um, <coughs> at the moment at peril of other threats facing London. And therefore, uh, for me to sit here and say, well, if we had more resources, things would be better. Of course they would. We are a people business. Um, and my experience of officers and staff that work in this area is that they are passionate about it. This is, ours is not an organisation that people join for fame and fortune. People join the police to do what the police is about, which is keeping people safe and keeping the city safe. And they are really committed to that aim. People who then choose to work in child protection and safeguarding are committing themselves into an area of business that is immensely complex, very challenging, and takes its toll on them. Mm -hmm. And we know that in terms of their own health and well-being and how stressful it is to work in these areas. They volunteer to do that, and they are really passionate. Where we find that outcomes for children are inadequate or require improvement, very often we also find that caseloads are high, that officers are stressed where we have vacancies there, um, and that inevitably has an effect. Uh, so I can sit and say, more resource and everything will be well. There are, of course, ways in which we can try and make that demand resource balance feel better. Some of that's in looking at our own processes and trying to make sure they're as lean and efficient as they possibly can be. Much of it is about working with partners and making a really conscious effort to look for root causes and address them earlier. And on the partnership element, one of the most challenging parts of, of actually doing this in London, in a city like this, is we have 32 boroughs, all the size of about Newcastle upon Tyne. You know, it's an enormous amount of geography. It's, there's a very complex governance structure which you'll appreciate. So rather than dealing with um, a single CCG and a, and a local authority, we have 32 of each. We have 37 acute care trusts. We have nine mental health trusts. And, and the mental health element of this is significant. So when we look across the complex patchwork of governance that we have, that's quite challenging to work through in terms of partnership because at my level, I can have a discussion with partners at that strategic level about what we want to achieve, but the police constable at three o'clock in the morning wants the same system to follow whether they are in one borough or another when they're trying to, do, to deal with somebody in acute need <coughs> in the middle of the night. So anything that can be done to enable some consistency across um, partners' delivery in London would be welcome, and we're in those conversations with health, with social care, um, and we just all recognise that this is challenging, and where we can find consistency, <coughs> it's incredibly helpful. Thank you. Just to to add a bit of context there as well. I mean, registered sex offenders, um, eight percent rise per annum. Now we don't have an eight percent rise in <coughs> the number of staff that we can put into our jigsaw units who are charged with the monitoring of very high and high-risk sex offenders. So very much um, demand that is, well, in that context, out of the success of a prosecution for someone who poses a risk to children, but actually out of our, outside of our control as well. So many of the things that were underreported 20 years ago when I joined the police are now thankfully being reported. It's almost a nice problem to have, but we have it. <clears throat> 
and we feel it on those teams, and those, those teams are in places particularly stressed, as, as Richard said. Okay. Thank you uh, some of the questions are already moving into some of your audio code, so perhaps you'd like to proceed. Okay, I've been uh, yeah. liaising with, with yeah. Len on that. Um, I wanted to pick up a couple of things um, from the discussion that you've just had. Um, one of them, you talked about the success of um, your campaign um, that you've got um, running, the Spot It, Spot It to Stop It campaign, and you said it was praised in here. Um, it actually wasn't. It said that the evaluation framework, they, they said it was encouraging, but the evaluation framework focuses on the success of the communication strategy rather than assessing the actual improvements in practice. So what changes are you making to make sure you're actually assessing how successful this is in terms of changing practice in the Met? I see. Um, okay. So the assessment of changed practice comes through the case audits and that, that framework I described with the dedicated inspection team. Yes, yes. So that's looking at outcomes which are proxy measures of whether that campaign has been successful. But the campaign was designed out of a staff survey that followed, that was initiated as a result of the 2016 report to find out about frontline staff attitudes towards safeguarding um, and managers' attitudes, and also to identify gaps in their knowledge, those capability gaps, which took some time to analyse several thousand um, verbatim comments about where people had confidence in using their skills, where they felt they were lacking. So that was a staff survey which helped design the campaign and also helped us design some of the training interventions we put in place. The evaluation of outcomes are through case audits. The further evaluation of whether we've had a cultural shift will be in a further survey to be conducted in March next year. And that won't be about whether everybody's seen the poster, it will be about what their attitude is towards their role in start in So you will spell that out, because that's obviously an important <coughs> difference yes. into what, what the HMIC had seen. Um, in terms of the um, Borough uh, Pathfinder sites, um, my understanding, um, I've been contacted by uh, a councillor in Redbridge who's told me, and that's one of the Pathfinder sites, that um, the way child protection had been handled, um, that generally, this has come from the local child protection committee, that they weren't happy with um, how the police had set about the reorganisation without talking to people who deal with child protection. The police only talk to people locally about child protection matters two months after the reorganisation had happened and by then it was too late to influence the process. Are you aware of that, that kind of feedback and concern that child protection seems to have been forgotten in this and what are you doing to, to ensure it's at the heart of any of these changes? Um, I was aware of the concerns both uh, through speaking to the senior leadership team in the East area where, where Redbridge is part um, and also through the oversight group that I mentioned earlier, chaired by the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime. So yes, I was aware. Um, do I think child protection was overlooked in the design? No, I don't. But there were clearly um, issues of concern raised there about the engagement, the timeliness of the engagement. The purpose of the Pathfinders was to surface issues and identify um, improvements if we are to roll the BCUs out further across London. So that learning, I have no doubt, has been registered and therefore as we move forward or if we move forward with further BCUs, um, I would expect that the engagement would happen earlier as a result of that feedback. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, we talked earlier about um, workload and I appreciate it's always been huge and when we did a big piece of work in 2014 on this it had gone up hugely. Um, supervisors generally fail to supervise investigations is what this latest report says that's pretty poor isn't it because the super supervisors have such an important role in managing workload and supporting your officers what's going wrong at that level they do uh, they have a very important role i may bring steve in in a second to talk through some of the detail of what his team have found around the supervision because it is pivotal to some of the delivery Again, it's the caseload issue often is cited by our supervisors who say the number of cases that they are required to supervise um, leads them to be doing so in a, in a way that they feel is not as thorough as they would like to. So again, we're looking at a resource and capacity matter there. I've already rehearsed some of the challenges around 
putting more resource into this area. So it is beholden, therefore, on us to look at the processes that we ask for supervisors to follow and identify any processes at all that add little or nothing to the safety of children in terms of outcomes so that they can focus their time on those supervisory tasks which will bring better outcomes, which will ensure people are safe. You're right to raise it, yeah. Steve. Uh, you're obviously your area of expertise. I think. Yeah, and I think you've you've probably articulated it, Richard, with the the capacity. These are complex, serious jobs that some sometimes last up to a year, two years before they even they're even prosecuted. Um, that level of investment over time, whilst the caseload keeps rising, whilst the the reports keep coming in, is difficult. It's difficult for the investigating officer. It's difficult for a supervisor when you might have six or seven detective constables to supervise, each with 10, 12, 14 complex jobs. That is not an excuse, that is a reality on, on, on the front line at the moment, and it has been since I was uh, head of the child abuse teams back in 2014. Um, I think there's a little bit around confidence as well. I think outside of child abuse investigations, on many of the borough um, units, uh, there's a lack, really a lack of confidence around, or lack of awareness around what partners can offer, a lack of confidence about picking up the phone to a social worker, when actually you've probably not been involved in that sort of area before. We're asking people who have been involved in volume crime increasingly to become involved in safeguarding. Um, the one thing that we, we know from the surveys that the supervisors and the DCs who are outside of the safeguarding departments are asking for that. They're asking for future training around the roles and remits of, um, of social workers, what they can offer. And I think we are actually taking on probably quite a lot at a borough level when in fact if we pick up the phone to a social worker we could share the problem and I don't think we have, we're at that stage yet of uh, of having a workforce, whether they're DCs or DSs, supervising, who feel that uh, that confident in, in in doing that, if I'm honest. And what are you doing, just just very specific, to improve your record taking, your documentation? You know, being criticised here that you don't always put further instance on the system. So then, when someone goes to look at a particular person, you don't have that case history. To actually make probably a more informed judgment and yeah, how I mean, at risk someone is, that's quite a serious criticism. Um, what are you doing to improve that across? It the is um, certainly one area, an important area, child sexual exploitation. Uh, since the 2016 report, uh, the central child sexual exploitation team has introduced an initial assessment team. That initial assessment team looks at every, and we'd appreciate obviously child sexual exploitation isn't a crime an offence in itself, it's a, it's a menu, a suite of crimes under the umbrella of CSE, so it can look like different things. Uh, the IAT, on a daily basis, look at every CRIS report in London. The point of that is to find where CSE may exist, where perhaps uh, we were unaware because of the, the, the nature of the crime that has been reported. Um, that is to ensure not just the fact that we properly crime and properly record um, incidents of CSE and other things, but it's also making sure that victims of CSE, uh, where it may be hidden uh, under another crime type, are given the service they deserve, and then it can be assessed category one to three and given to the unit best place to deal with that crime. So that's just one example. Richard may have, have, some, have something to say on this, but certainly from my perspective, an important step uh, in, in understanding one particular emerging threat and current threat, Pan London. And I think on, on the recording side, um, <clears throat> the, there are a, a couple of areas of this, not just crime reporting. So criticism in the 2016 report referred to the fact that we were not routinely putting a Merlin record on for every child that comes through custody, and we have 21,000 children still coming through our custody suites every year. Um, more recent figures, um, I think I'm right in saying that that is almost 100%, or that is 100% now through custody. That's through a retraining initiative during the last 12 months, which has been successful. Um, 
I mentioned earlier about some genuine increases in volume demand that we're seeing, and we're seeing um, at least two areas of crime that were really quite specialist now becoming volume. So in the indecent images of children, used to solely be dealt with by a very specialist unit, um, you know, very high-tech investigations. That's now, with a seven-fold increase in the last few years, that is having to be, in, in some areas, dealt with as a volume <coughs> crime where the elements of risk are lower. Um, where there are questions as to whether an image constitutes a crime or not, we have put in a, um, an internal policy by default, any suggestion of that is being treated as a crime. So we will record it on the crime system even if we subsequently find that it doesn't meet the threshold rather than treat it as intelligence and then only treat it as a crime once we've substantiated it. So we, we've taken that step, but it does mean we're having to look at some of our local investigators as having to investigate what was very much specialist investigations in the past and therefore using the specialist team to roll out training to them and give them that specific training and the resource they need to view these images and the occupational health support for the impact that it has on having to view images of that nature. Um, all very complex and something that we used to be able to do in specialist teams and we now can't. And I think the next area where we will see a volume safeguarding issue which used to be treated as very specialist is around modern slavery where we have a specialist, a successful specialist modern slavery team. Um, but we are now recognising that some of the criminal exploitation of children and county lines <coughs> and other forms of criminal exploitation is a manifestation of modern slavery for under-18s in that criminal context. Um, an awful lot of those people will be coming through our custody suites and we can foresee that some of that may become volume for local investigators as well. Some boroughs are already investigating that. I think Lewisham is a, is a great example of that where there is a partnership approach with the local authority to look at the crossover between the cohort of young people who are affected by serious youth violence, who are also going missing, who are turning up linked to drug dealing elsewhere in the country, and, and also either have girlfriends who've been subject to CSE or are subject to CSE themselves, if it's the girls that are trafficking the drugs. They're seeing that crossover, and rather than having separate meetings to discuss those cohorts, are doing it all in one place. Yeah. And out of that, we've seen some of those investigations where rather than treating the children as suspects of drug supply in county lines, they're being treated as victims of, of modern slavery offences. Well, that sounds like a very good practice, which is, is reassuring um, if that's happening in one borough and that needs to be rolled out. But one more question for the police before I want to get some response from our other guests. Um, you touched on custody and we know there's a shortage of detention rooms and there's all that, those issues around the accommodation, but you were criticised that um, in numerous cases the appropriate adult was absent when the child was charged. In some cases, strip searches of children took place without the presence of an appropriate adult. I mean, that's a really serious concern, but I note in the report it does talk about you establishing a multi-agency working group to improve um, ch child detention practice. I was wondering if you'd give us a bit of background about that as, as well as addressing that serious issue. Yes, yeah, so the, the multi-agency group is chaired by Martin Pratt um, and it addresses the issue. Um, there are two issues actually in parallel. One is about the provision of appropriate adults for children mm -hmm. in our custody suites um, and also the provision of suitable accommodation for children who are to be kept in custody. I think at the time of the original report, uh, all bar one of the children kept in custody had remained in police custody rather than gone into local authority care, as they should have done. Um, and we had reached a point, I think, where most custody officers were making a telephone call to a local authority in the absolute expectation that no accommodation would be forthcoming. The conversations that we're having through <coughs> London councils with local authorities uh, on these subjects are helpful. Uh, I am hopeful that we will get an outcome that means there is better provision for young people that are in our custody suites so we are not left with them in our care and that we will have greater provision of appropriate adults and therefore we're able to get them to the child in a timely manner when they're in custody. The, the issue is wider than that though and not mentioned in the report but I think it's, it's key to raise it here because we've mentioned mental health on a couple of occasions. Changes to the Policing and Crime Act, um, or from the Policing and Crime Act, mean that um, where we detain somebody under Section 136 of the Mental Health Act, 
We will now never take a juvenile into custody under those circumstances. We already weren't. Um, and we will only take adults in exceptional circumstances. And we'd already reduced that, that number by about 92% down to single figures. But the issue behind that are those young people and adults, but young people in particular, who come into our custody lawfully for a crime purpose and are detained under PACE, and then subsequently, because of our concerns around them or concerns from health colleagues who work in our custody suites, we request, we request a mental health assessment and find that they should not be in custody but should be in suitable, secure accommodation for somebody in an acute mental health crisis. There is simply not the provision available that our colleagues in health can access to then move that young, young person who's now become a patient to somewhere more appropriate than a custody suite. Um, we are sometimes literally left holding the baby and that, that simply can't be right. And there's a huge amount of work being done with our health colleagues uh, looking at how wider provision can be provided. Bring, bring in um, the other guests on the panel. Obviously, early on you said you felt there had been progress, but where is there still room for improvement? Maybe I'll start with you, Gwen, because we're just picking up on that mental health issue. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think that... Um, um, clearly, in London as a whole, um, there, are, there, are, there are a shortage of what we call kit, CAMS Tier 4 beds, which are the beds which would be accessed um, in, su in such a case. So there is enormous amount of work happening in London, but also nationally around you know, looking at the bed capacity in London and increasing that capacity and commissioning capacity and looking at where we need to commission that, um, that capacity. So that work is happening now. It's part of CAN's transformation and it's recognised in London that that is a need and we're working with our partners in respect of where best that provision is. So, so there is a lot of commissioning work happening around CAN's in so London. When, when would you expect there to be additional beds? Because we've heard this when we've done custody visits and the like as well. Yes. They, they will be coming online in, in, in stream. So we, we're already commissioning additional beds right. now and they will be, uh, they will come it will be a, a phased approach, but it's, it's something which we're looking around identifying what the gap is in London, what the need for additional beds are and where we need to put those, those beds. There's also um, a programme of repatriating people that are out of boroughs back into boroughs. So it's not just a matter of creating additional beds in London for new, new cases. It's about bringing people back into London that we've maybe placed outside of London and a whole chunk of work is already happening about doing that. So um, I'm confident that there will be additional capacity in London based on the, that, those commissioning intentions and those needs. What sort of numbers are we talking? Are we talking tens? Are we talking hundreds? Um, I, I wouldn't want to be quoted on um, numbers but I do know that we are, uh, um, we are commissioning at, at least ten extra beds from um, um, from for, for London, um, but uh, that there may well be more. Um, it, it, but I wouldn't want to be held to account for. No, no, no. Money. I just wanted to get a feel. So really, it's it's a handful of extra, which is welcome, but it's not a massive boost. It's that there's um, <coughs> regarding CAMS two four. There's a lot of additional work happening. It's um, it's about commissioning additional beds, but it's also about looking at the pathway that mm. children come into the mental health system and their lengths of stays and what can be what can be done to discharge young people that are maybe in um, mental health um, accommodation where they don't need to be. So they it's about it's about them. you free yeah. up capacity. So it, it's the the, <coughs> the actual um, commissioning intentions looks at the whole of the transformation of CAMS to reduce. Um, length of bed stays to free up capacity as well. Okay. And on top of um, that, are there any other areas for improvement that you think between health and, and the police? Uh, one, one, one thing which I think w which we probably need to do more of, we are, we are beginning to do that much more systematically, is maybe sharing best practice across um, um, organisations, particularly in respect of culture change. And obviously in health, we, we've gone through enormous changes as well in, in our structures and our organisations, and that continues to happen with our sustainability and transformation plans, um, boroughs coming together. So we can echo some of that cultural work. And we've used um, uh, <coughs> clinical champions in health mm. to um, at the front line to champion cultural change and so I think that probably what we not we need to do as partners is perhaps share some of though that learning mm. um, ac with across organizations more more effectively <coughs> the other thing which we're doing as well and I think all partners in respect of the child safeguarding space is when um, an agency spots something which maybe they feel uncomfortable with and and we we have had a, a recent um a, a recent we we do our own serious in, in investigation 
it doesn't sit within like a serious case review, but it sits within mm -hmm. an internal management review. And we share that learning and we involve partners as well. So I think more, more of those initiatives would help raise, raise yes. some of the, um, the, the practice. I think the police are challenged um, in respect of working with both health and social care because of the geography of London and because we have lots of emerging new structures and organisations happening and that is also part of devolution as well mm. which will really inc increase the, um, the, the com complexity for good reason to look at to bring more local ownership to make sure that care is delivered much closer to the people who are commissioning services who understand the local needs so there's real there is real drivers to do that but when you're working in an organization like metropolitan police and you're having to navigate that really complex and changing area I think that it's, it's up to us as partners to support the police in understanding that landscape and using the structures that are there to engage with the police and recognising the police cannot be everywhere, but we need mechanisms to ensure that we have that intelligence sharing. If I may, just one point around whether the health partnership has worked really well, which we've valued, has been the liaison on diversion services that we now have from NHS England in, in every one of our custody suites, and also perhaps illustrating the complexity where we have had three or four areas where a street triage service has been provided and commissioned for people in acute mental health crisis, so that would include children, which has dramatically reduced the number of people that we need to then take to that tier four service. Um, and we have been really encouraged by the engagement from the Mental Health Trust and from NHS England on the possibility of expanding that to be a London-wide triage service which also is supported by some of the recommendations in Elish Angelini's latest report around deaths in custody. So all of the movement in the right direction and the liaison diversion services we have now are, are excellent and we're really grateful for We'll them. pick that up in our health care and custody work we're going to be doing shortly as well. Um, David, Angela, can you tell me where you think there is still room for improvement? I think, I'm just reflecting on the, the debate in the last half an hour or so, I mean it just articulates, doesn't it, the, uh, the complexities of... Um, the, such a changing and dynamic environment in which all the agencies are working in and therefore the, the responses that you know, colleagues in the police which we've just been talking about are having to make in order to be able to, to work to that. I guess, I mean, I was thinking back when we were having this conversation, we all hark back to previous times, don't we? But that importance of the kind of, there the was the beat on the bobby, that first responder, that, that first, that your first responder's knowledge of what a child and young person that you've come into contact might actually be experiencing and having the confidence to look beyond the kind of presenting issue for me. I, I mm. suspect it's still something that you're trying to, I think you yes. were talking through earlier in your answers, that you're really trying to break through in, in, in the importance of that. Uh, and I think that's vitally important. I remember in my first social work job, we, in a team that I worked in there, we, we knew how beat offices, they knew us, that confidence to come through the front door of that local social care office. I know the world has changed, but let's not forget, you know, history sometimes teaches us an awful lot, and I think that's something that I'd like to pick up on. A couple of other points, I think. I mean, um, the point that we were talking about at the end of it, about um, provision to adequately support young people who are otherwise kept in cells overnight. I mean, this is, again, indicative, isn't it, of... You know, there are, there's, there's a national shortage, let alone a London shortage, of, of suitable foster placements for looked after children in general. If you move it into um, really specialised placements, be they fostering, be they residential, etc., with the skill set that that needs, it puts it into in another kind of perspective. So it's, it's, it's something that the, the you know, commissioners, the commissioning environment needs to consider, let alone how we skill up individuals to be able to support, support those placements. We've talked a lot about county lines. I think this, you know, there's a, that interesting report from the National Crime Agency. It's only come out this week in respect to that. There are some frightening stories in that report in terms of the vulnerability of young people and indeed vulnerable adults, which, mm -hmm. which this, is, this is, I think this is, this is, I think we're only at the very start of really understanding this. I'm sure colleagues in the police would understanding that and how it relates to the, the broader CSC, the missing environment, the trafficking environment, the modern slavery. This is just opening up layers and layers of complexity, I think, around this issue, which is going to challenge us for the immediate future. Thank you, Angela. Um, for me, it, it really focuses on those partnership arrangements and those protocols <coughs> which help to support those partnership arrangements. 
and it's sort of recognising the crossover in our roles, particularly around sharing intelligence. Um, and when we talk about training, I think it's not just about training the police, it's also about training our staff who work with the young people um, to provide, because we gather a huge amount of intelligence. Um, we train our staff in terms of taking obvious things, you would think, but in terms of take car registration numbers, get those mobile numbers, make sure that you record and share that with the police. And we've got some really good examples of, of where we've shared really significant information um, with the police. Um, but also about, there was, the, there was the example that you gave earlier um, mm. of that case. And when you were talking about that, I was thinking, what were the social workers, what were the managers doing about this? Mm. Because the fact that the police didn't turn up it's not good enough. So I think it's about having those really good partnership arrangements, but also within those partnership mm -hmm. arrangements, making sure that we challenge each other. Yes. You know, that we use an escalation policy, we complain where we need to. And, and that's vital. Um, and that's where partnership arrangements, I feel, are truly effective. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll leave it there, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'll be writing, as suggested, to the Pathfinder Boroughs uh, for their... Um, thoughts around improvements or, or otherwise, as, as recommended. Um, we've already touched upon resourcing and training, but I think, Andrew, you've got some specific questions around um, that. Well, I think most things I was going to ask you have been, I believe so, been but dealt with. Please do. Um, just one thing, I think, on, on resources. Can you tell us how many officers short you are compared to what you think you, the establishment should be, and in particular, how many of those are supervisors as opposed to just investigators? I mean, it is actually very difficult because when we, <coughs> when we consider dedicated child abuse investigators, um, we have 75 DSs, <coughs> we have 208 DCs, we have 68 police conference liaison officers who are support staff members who share information with social care, and we have around about 35, 37 uh, researchers, intelligence researchers, who trawl the intel systems to make sure we're sharing the right information. Um, the last update I got from the child abuse teams was that their um, deployable asset is 70% of that of those totals. That's the figures you just gave up, that's the establishment, right? That's the establishment. Still posts. Yep. Okay. Uh, sorry, they're the, they're the budgeted posts, so we are 70% of the budget of, of those uh, totals. There's... Um, there's a few things at play there. Um, the child abuse investigation teams are, are heavily uh, represented by uh, female colleagues, which uh, obviously is, is a good thing, but has uh, an implication with it as well. So many of them are on maternity, maternity leave. There's a, an element of uh, workplace stress as well, which I'll be, um, be remiss of me not to, uh, not to represent as well. Uh, which obviously feeds into those uh, those abstractions, and also uh, we're not immune to things happening uh, on a on a fairly grand scale in the Met at times. Whether that be uh, pressures from outside uh, operations that, that come in, or indeed um, child abuse operations uh, which need resourcing. Uh, so we're going to take child uh, child protection professionals from those areas. Uh, as is uh, the, the sort of normal course of events. Other areas of the Met also undertake child protection uh, investigations. Many of those are on borough. 25% uh, of Sapphire Rape Command's work involves children, albeit not generally in the family setting. Um, we have uh, officers within SCNO um, who deal with uh, indecent images of children on, on the sort of specialist side and and non-specialist side on, on boroughs. So to say that we, we need certain amounts of officers in certain places is a difficult ask here and now for me. Um, what I could say is that, you know, that the maths have, has been done, the science has been done, the budgets have been set, but we're 70% up to those budgets, we're 30% um, short of them in terms of people who are turning up to work doing a job for the children of London. Because of um, because of those abstractions, and there is a sorry, um, there's a there's a wider yeah, context here. You, we are go on, Richard, can we're, I just, we're several please, hundred please. detectives short across yes, the whole no, of the I mean, Met. So, yeah, so this I've, is just I've part of a wider with, picture. With, with him already, 
Just going back to what Stephen was saying, you also mentioned people being on leave and not uh, on uh, maternity leave, yeah. stress and so forth. Of that 70%, how, how, many, how many jobs are effectively de facto vacant because of people being off work for one reason or another? Uh, very, very difficult. From, I, I can get, certainly get those right. figures in more granular detail, but in, certainly... In round, in round terms? Certainly... Um, 50 well, 52 per cent of the workforce on child protection uh, was always the figure banded about that were, were female. I think at any one time we, we have around 30 members of staff who may be off on maternity. We have um, a number of staff members, I think 15 currently within uh, the, the Kate um, child, uh, Specialist Child Abuse Department who are not deployable because of various health issues, not just workplace stress, but various uh, health issues that have come out. Uh, some of those are um, because we, we clearly have people who have been on in this line of work a long time. It is very demanding, it is very rewarding, but at the same time demanding. Those stresses can creep up on individuals after time. Equally, we try and keep those skills as best we can within that remit because they are an asset and we've we've obviously invested so we do everything we can to support them to stay sometimes that's not possible um i can get you the the probably more the, the more granular figures uh, perhaps after this meeting they're the sort of broad pressures and stresses that you know the, the superintendents and, and dcis face on a, on a daily basis just on a quick attempt at maths it's about 10 percent yeah 10 percent was 30 percent abstraction yeah in total so probably and another 10 percent there of people who are off with maternity health issues etc <coughs> quite possibly quite possibly i mean i mean that's not the exact figure but of that order so. uh, uh, yes yeah, certainly if that that order would not uh, would not surprise me so at you're all you're down to actually about 60 percent of budgeted posts you're right to us to confirm. I I'll, I'll right to confirm, but certainly, 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 thirty percent. We are thirty percent short of uh, the, the number in terms of deployable asset. And of course, let's not forget, um, we have annual leave. We have courses. Uh, we have other other issues yeah. as well. We have court, which obviously can take an officer out of out of play for a month. But those, those will be taken into account of in, in terms of the budget numbers, the, the routine training, and, Gen and, and, and yeah, ordinary leave, and so forth. But long term. Sick yeah. or long term maternity yeah. leave, or, or the unplanned the stuff. About. I mean, the that, unplanned stuff only uh, yeah. becomes a problem when it's when it is that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Happy with that. Okay. We've we've talked about the aspect of of child sexual exploitation already, but we've got some, uh, which is historically underreported. We have got some specific questions you can pick up. What's not been covered, John? Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so specifically about child sexual exploitation, I think, um, Richard, you were talking about some numbers in terms of the rise year on year. I think you said it might be 8%, but I don't know whether that was child sexual exploitation or, or wider reports of child <coughs> protection issues. Do you have any, any numbers about the increase you're seeing in uh, reports? Or, I mean, obviously this, this report from HMIC came out a year ago, but I think in the context of trying to make improvements, I think you're also seeing a continued rise. If you can give us some idea of the numbers there, that would be very useful. We, <coughs> we are seeing um, an increase in awareness of this that we didn't have before. This, this wasn't even an, an issue that we measured previously. Um, certainly it features regularly in um, our missing persons inquiries so we will see who is you know that's one of the risk factors that we will now look for um, perhaps before where um, the phrase streetwise was seen as, as a, a reason to reduce risk i think now if that phrase is used for, for most of our um, investigators they would see that as an increased risk because of all the connotations that we now understand um, i don't have numbers here on the increase that we're seeing um, our concerns are Actually, the amount of under-reporting, Children's Commissioner has reported that, that usually when, when, when um, issues have been surfaced, only about one in eight of the children affected were previously known to um, children's services or the authorities one way or the other. So the question for us is how many children are there who are affected by this that we don't currently see? Um, at the 
As of last month, we had uh, 2,900 CSE crime reports on our system. I don't know what, under what period of time that they came in because um, the way that we work particularly with CSE is to leave crime reports open, whereas most of our crime reporting, you'll understand there's an allegation, we then go through to some either closing the case or, or a um, criminal justice outcome and then the case is closed. With CSE, we recognise that the risk to that young person tends to be ongoing, even if it's not from the same perpetrator because of risky behaviours, lifestyles, complex needs and so on. So those, those, crimes, those crime reports stay open so that they are a way of continually um, reviewing the safety of the young person concerned. So, but th those are the numbers. In terms of a year-on-year -year increase, I, we will be able to analyse that and, and we can write to the committee and give them yeah. those numbers. Yeah. Um, we've got the number that, that during 2016, the calendar year, there were 17,000 investigations into child sexual abuse, which is the crime category as opposed to child sexual exploitation. Do you have a sense that that's higher this year already? Uh, I, think, I think, if I'm honest, I think we're struggling with that <coughs> figure. Okay. Um, certainly from, <coughs> from the research and the information that I've got, that looks significantly lower, around about sort of 2,000, 700 mark. Um, but certainly, seventeen thousand is uh, even for the even for the even for London is is a huge number. So I, I would question. I would okay, question we, that we've as got a, it from the police and crime plan. So right. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> if you can look look at that up. That would be really helpful to get a yeah, yeah, picture. Yeah. And also whether or not, like you say, if during a period of trying to mm. improve, you're also yeah. seeing an increase in in workload. That would be I mean, interesting uh, to know. Essentially, whether it's 17,000 or two, two and a half thousand, um, one is too many, um, I think we'd agree. That's but um, it, it may be a question of whether we're talking about child sexual abuse investigations or child abuse in its widest sense, child sexual abuse, yeah. which may be defined in different ways. So, again, we'll That's clarify nice. the figures for the committee and, and be happy to come back on those. Yeah. That would be very useful. Um, can I speak to um, the wider um, voluntary sector or the charity sector about this as well? Um, David and Angela, do you have a sense that this is an increasing problem or one that's emerging more and becoming more um, more reportable? Are you making more reports to the police about these kinds of issues? Yeah, I think certainly um, with the focus on child ex sexual exploitation, um, that's been very helpful in terms of training and identifying and reporting. So we've certainly seen an increase. And it's not seen in isolation. Um, as I spoke about earlier, so some of, it's actually really trying to interrogate some of the presenting issues that we see from young people um, and really looking at those in more depth. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes where identification of CSE also does, does emerge, whereas previously, a few years ago, it may not have in the same way. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, in terms of the... Uh, and it's probably indicative of... Um, I mean, it's, it, uh, CSE is one of our is one of Bernardo's organisational priorities. So, in, in, in respect to that, it's something that we've spent both um, direct service delivery time and, and resources in, but also in terms of trying to broaden the organisational <coughs> awareness and cross organisational awareness as well. Um, one of the one of the current pieces of involvement, for instance, is um, it's DFE funded, but the um, um, Child Sex Abuse Centre of Excellence, um, which is an awareness raising. Bernardo's is hosting it. Um, LGA are very, very much involved in it as well, but that's that's about trying to develop a level of understanding and research across the whole CSE, CSE agenda, and, and and demonstrating that across all the agencies that are involved in it. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the the mayor's police and crime plan. Um, which I think was, was very good in, in some ways in the way it described the overlap of vulnerability to, to different things and that should be um, leading to the Mayor, uh, the Met, identifying more of the different vulnerabilities people have when they present with what, I mean what you said just now about streetwise children, being at risk children is, is a really good point. Is there anything else you can say about that in relation to child sexual exploitation. There's certainly been work done by the government on, on gangs and, and sexual exploitation, which seems to be 
something that's that's even newer um, in a way. Children involved in in gang violence, um, <coughs> not just the county line side of things, but that seems to be been uncovered in, in more recent months as well. Yeah, I think um, probably a couple of things to talk about, both internally from the Met and then externally in the wider partnership. So <coughs> internally in the Met, we talked earlier about the fact that my role was created as a result of the 2016 report. My role uh, spans safeguarding both for children and adults because um, it's manifestly obvious that some of our most um, vulnerable young people at the age of 18 then become vulnerable adults. Um, at that period of transition is a, is a critical risk for, around their health, social care, around policing. It's where we see our gangs cohort. It's where we see our radicalisation cohort. Um, so we recognise that risk, hence I have all of those various um, elements. The overlap between them, the lead responsible officers within the Met who are leading on policy and professional development in those areas, um, <coughs> absolutely recognise the overlap of cohorts. But I think it's really careful we're not too um, prescriptive in our thinking. So not all CSE is linked to gangs, not all of our um, gang members will be involved in child criminal exploitation and, and so on, but they certainly manifest a number of different vulnerabilities and I think the key for policing was to move from a position where people were seen as either a victim or a suspect and recognising that a lot of our vulnerable victims may go on to become prolific offenders. They may remain vulnerable while they're offending as well and we deal with that to recognise people not by the crime type that's manifesting itself in front of us, but by the range of vulnerabilities that affect them. And we're now seeing that in the way that we engage with partners. And some of the work through um, the Co MOPAX co-commissioning fund, some of the, the pan-London and sub-regional bids that have come in there have been focused around CSE and approach from that very aspect of looking the, at the, the range of other um, issues that are affecting the young people, so where CSE or county lines might be the driver and the way they come to notice, then engaging and uncovering what lies behind that, what other vulnerabilities do they have, and, and what basket of interventions is going to be best to address that, who should lead, and so on. And this, this is mirrored by work um, in other places in the country, but specifically for London, I think some of the initiatives under that co-commissioning fund are promising. Okay, um, Gwen, I think possibly there's, there's implications there for the, the wider um, work that you do bringing together partners um, to what extent are they keeping a you know, close eye on the, the growing breadth of overlying and overlapping vulnerabilities that there are? I think again on a number of levels I, I think um, purely from a commissioning point of view I know that, that NHS England have supported the um, child sexual abuse referral centres with, with additional funding to, to, to work with um, partners to support that, that work and grow that work to respond to increasing needs, so that, that's happened. <coughs> I think the also thing which we, we've also recognised that in looking at serious case reviews over the last few years, the recognition of um, sexual ch child sexual ex exploitation being um, a real risk and there's some real learning from a system in respect of some of those serious case reviews, so that's raised and sharing that learning and raising awareness across partner agencies is also changing how partners are recognising and responding to child sexual exploitation, looking at the complexities, um, working very, very closely with um, education, having much more of an inquiring mind. So you're, you're not, not just um, uh, training professionals to, to see one, one element, you're, you're opening up um, perspectives around that. So I think on a number of levels, I think child sexual exploitation is now um, in the really the mainstream of most um, health professionals' um, vocabulary and understanding the, the systems that sit behind that. From a commissioning point of view, I think we do need to work with partners about effectiveness, evaluating what is working, um, looking at where there are where, where there are gaps, but also looking at the quality of provision, because we do know that that um, it isn't just about having provision; it's about having good quality provision that, that looks at outcomes so doing some more focus around what we're looking around expected outcomes in in provision around child sexual exploitation and what supports that work so um david and, and angela um the the service provision for the for the children um the victims is something you get involved with um what do you think are the biggest gaps there in terms of, I mean, it's not about investigations, this is about the support that, that, that victims need. 
It's interesting because working for St Christopher's, we opened up two children's homes in London um, for girls who are victims of child sexual exploitation um, <coughs> and some of the associated behaviours around that. And that was, a, that was a pilot project to look at keeping girls within their own communities because there's very much a focus on moving not only girls um, mm. out to the country, um, far away from their own communities, sometimes to secure services. So our pilot project was very much looking at how we work with the communities, how we work with the local police, so that the girls are treated as victims rather than being punished. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a huge amount of learning. Um, it, was, it, it was incredibly difficult, incredibly challenging, I think, for all the, the services involved. And the biggest thing around it, I think, was managing the risk um, and a bit of holding, holding the nerve. Because um, as I said earlier, what, when we're working with this group of girls, as I said, when we're working with these girls, we had the presenting CSE as the, the major presenting issue. But underneath that was a whole range of other issues. You know, I mentioned trauma, I mentioned abuse. Um, and it sort of very much around working with those underlying really quite significant issues linking into mental health resources. And there is a gap. There's a real gap in, men in mental health resources in terms of being able to receive those in a timely, timely fashion. Um, because it's actually working with these girls' time scales. I think the other thing that struck us very much throughout the, the project and the girls that we worked with was um, linking into thresholds and how late they'd come to the notice of social care professionals and come into the care system. So the average age of our girls was around 15. Um, so some of these patterns of behaviours were really, really embedded by that time. But also um, the effects of the trauma and abuse were really, really really embedded in, into them. So, you know, our focus was, is, has always been very much on relationship building with these girls, building self-esteem, building confidence, giving them a childhood. Um, so in terms of your question, in terms of the gaps, I think it is about the delay in accessing mental health resources. We, we've, we had some, some really good results, um, but generally they were very, very difficult to access, um, and that was the biggest gap. I've already talked about some of the issues of dealing, working with other partners and lack of understanding and training and recognition, um, but that, that it certainly, I feel, has improved over the two years that the project ran. David, do you have so, anything to add? Yeah, so I think just to add to that, I think critically it's about the sustainability of service provision and the scalability of it as well. I mean, an awful lot of what um, um, many agencies get involved in is relatively short term in terms of its um, um, the, you know, the, the fiscal sums in order to happen. I mean, sexual exploitation is a process and enabling young people to find a way out of it is very similar to, to supporting um, victims of to, um, domestic violence. It's about intensive support for providing young people with that sense of security. And if that's within a service that has is, is short term, then clearly you're giving someone a degree of false hope in respect to that. So you know, having that security as a counterbalance to the pull of exploiters is absolutely critical to you know, enabling young people to move out of it. And that, I mean, just what Angela was saying, that proactively connecting children <coughs> and people to specialist support services is a critical element of that as well. Um, in terms of the <coughs> police, I mean, I'm assuming that better support for victims would lead to, to more quality prosecutions, more confidence to give evidence, those kinds of things. Is that something you're working on in terms of your outcomes work? Um, yes. But our view, particularly around this subject, is very much more about the right outcome and a, and a safe outcome for the child victim. Um, so if the underlying issues are around their mental health and they're traumatised, that's an outcome that we would like to see delivered, particularly with, with this group who, uh, I, I mentioned about the, the, the two-thirds of the crime reports that we have where there's a suggestion of but no crime allegation. We find particularly with this cohort of very vulnerable young people, they don't recognise that they're being exploited. They don't recognise themselves as victims. So we're not even at that threshold of trying to get a victim to support a prosecution or provide evidence or have the confidence to go through a criminal justice process. They're not even there at recognising that they're being victimised. And that's the real challenge because we recognise it and so do partners and we're looking to put interventions in place 
to look after them, but they are nowhere near looking towards criminal justice outcome for that. That doesn't stop us looking towards perpetrators and seeing if there are other interventions that we can put in place to prevent them causing harm either to that victim or to any other victims um, through their involvement in other types of criminality, for example. And this is where we get taken back into the um, overlapping nature of some of these offences. So we might find that a perpetrator involved in CSE, for example, is also exploiting children for other criminal purposes or vulnerable adults. We see cuckooing and crack houses and, and the like. So where there's another opportunity around the perpetrator, we'd look to take it. Okay, um, and then finally, on I think earlier on, Angela and David both said something about the the fact that people come with a presenting problem, a crisis, and and they come in contact with the police or they come in contact with you. But you said there may be years of other problems that have effectively been neglected um, because of pressures on other services. Um, if, there's, if there's something, I mean, we are obviously Police and Crime Committee, there's the Mayor, who is the person we um, feed back to, but is there anything the Mayor can do, do you think, to try and improve things at that lower level in terms of providing positive relationships for young people? Um, it's something I've, I've been looking at youth service cuts in, in councils, for example, um, and obviously youth workers are positive relationships that young people can build up. Obviously, that's a council-level service. Is that, can the mayor do anything to fill that gap at all in that level slightly below where people are in, are in crisis? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying very hard not just to say resources. Um, but I think, with, with resources? But I, think, yeah, I, think it, I think it does come down to resources. Mm -hmm. I think it does come down to giving young people a range of opportunities to make contact with positive adults in their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's not just youth services, it's advocacy services, it's independent visitors, it's um, a range of professionals that, and, and you know, also I think one of, the, one of the fantastic opportunities is schools and the resources that we put into schools for children and young people to access. And I see some really good outcomes where there are some schools that, that have some fantastic services within them. Um, to support young people. So, so I, I talked earlier, didn't I, about the, um, about the thresholds, and um, I, I'm with you. I'll just read a very small bit from, the, uh, from this report, Beneath the Threshold, it's a Children England um, report which was done earlier in the year, so it's called Beneath the Threshold, Voluntary Sector Perspectives on Child Safeguarding in London. So it very much looked at it from the perspective of the community-based voluntary sector rather than uh, organisations such as myself, and just to pick up the point you were point saying out about about provision. So it talks about um, a kind of sandwich between universal services and specialist crisis intervention are the plethora of optional and locally varied services and interventions initiatives that perform functions and offer services that by no means every child will need or want, but which for some will be essential. And it goes on to talk about that range from community halls, playgrounds, children centres organised volunteering, community sports, youth centres, etc., etc., and recognising increasingly there's, there's, there's a pressure on the continuation and facilitation of those resources. Some of those local, um, locally-based services are often, often operating out of premises, which, shall we say, are less than suitable, borderline unfit on occasions, but it's that access, it's that knowledge of those kind of, it's that kind of first responder type scenario again I think is really critical in relation to this and, and these are these are these are really I think important locally based community organizations they will have that local intelligence in the widest sense of that word and knowledge of children and young people of people who are coming into communities who perhaps um, are both vulnerable but also um, you know, and, and primarily <coughs> vulnerable as well so the kind of intelligence I'm sure your colleagues will want to pick up and in terms of Sudden people, people arriving into areas that have not previously been known in the areas, etc., etc. Um, would you like to comment, maybe just on finally on how the the police? We've got safer schools officers who are increasing in number. We've got dedicated ward officers potentially at this sort of lower level, belief threshold. They could be doing some quite <coughs> positive work with voluntary and community-based organisations. That, that's right, and I think. Um, we, we see safer schools and dedicated ward officers as fundamental parts of the building blocks around safeguarding. Um, we talked earlier around registered sex offenders. We have an initiative called Operation Beat so that they now are aware of where registered sex offenders are within their wards, where previously 
it was a separate unit dealing with that and they weren't aware. It, it, it sounds an obvious step and it was and that's what we've done. Um, so they, they do have a role. We are completing reports into our Merlin system now to a greater volume than we ever did before around children that may be at risk. We don't conform to the threshold, so those reports go on quite often well below the threshold. I think the challenge, though, for our partners in social care in particular is being able to see the wood for the trees. So what we, what we need is, is IT provision and an analytical provision to be able to understand amongst that plethora of reports underneath the threshold those patterns that actually add up to something more serious we're looking at options around that i know our partners are as well so so we now at least have the information going into the system the trick for us will be to uh, to understand it and it does take us back to that point earlier about the complexity of london where we get <coughs> particularly some of the most vulnerable families moving from borough to borough and across boundaries where previously we've lost some of that information and i think we just really need to be careful about that and we're, we're back to the earlier point around information sharing candidly. Okay, thank you. So just to confirm, so the new card, or shall we say the DWOs, are taking responsibility <coughs> both in training and responsibility around CSE and other child protection issues in their, in their patches? There is an expectation on the DWOs, um, and I'm mindful we have one in, in the room today, um, that we, we do ask an awful lot of them. But our expectation is that within their ward, they know those people who are most vulnerable, and they also know those people who are most harmful. They may be the same cohort or an overlapping cohort. And they also know those people in the ward, very much back to your description of, of um, beat officers in the past, where we can leverage support from and work in partnership. So they, they um, generate those local networks who are able to keep an eye on it. it in an average ward, I think it's too much to ask that the dedicated ward officer will know all of those people and be intervening in all of their lives on a very regular basis. But certainly, um, we are looking at them as being our eyes and ears at the very front of the safeguarding agenda. Yeah, I mean, their responsibilities will be to, as you say, get underneath the community, understand the relationships, the families, and to be able to identify potential issues and then possibly pass them <coughs> on to our To partners. identify and refer, I think, would be yeah, a fair description yeah. amongst their other duties. Certainly, indeed, yeah. indeed so. Right, I think well, one last question before we move to our last yes, set. Sorry, um, this figure of 17,000 investigations in 2016, that is a phenomenal amount, it seems to me. It, do you have any comparison sort of for 2015, 14? Is it seriously rising? Um, those are the figures that I said. I, I will certainly write to the to the committee right. and, and, and give you those exact numbers so that we can see. Yep. Um, and, and we will do our best to make them clear. So if there have been any changes in Home Office accounting rules during mm -hmm. those times, we'll try and make sure that's really clear so that the committee can see the volume that we're dealing with and the increases year in year. Mm. I'm just trying to get a picture in my mind of, uh, without obviously, you know, being too graphic, of this sexual abuse, where is it actually originated? I mean, you've, you, we've mentioned you know, trafficking and, and the wider things, but what are we actually talking about here? What kind of abuse? I mean, you know, if you could just paint a bit of a picture. I'll, I'll, I'll come to Steve yeah. uh, in a second, if I may, because this was um, his, very much his area of business, but we're talking um, around child sexual exploitation, either below the threshold for a criminal um, act to have taken place or above. We're talking about familial abuse sometimes. We're talking about abuse outside the family. Sometimes we're look, talking about uh, peer group, and there was mention around gangs and CSE. Um, around indecent images of children, we see some of that peer group sharing of indecent images mm. amongst teenagers, some of which will be um, highly exploitative, um, as well as organised paedophilia and networks, both online and contact offenders. So there are a range of um, deeply unpleasant and troubling offences within that bracket. I see. So are you dealing with any kind of Rotherham, Rochdale situations as well? Um, we around if, if, if you're talking specifically around child sexual exploitation, we categorise the allegations that come into us into three levels mm -hmm. uh, and as I said that lower level where two-thirds of them sit is the is the suspicion only uh, and no specific allegation um, we do have live investigations into perpetrators of CSE we 
have not had in London the, um, the type of incident that you're describing at that scale, um, but that's not to say that it doesn't exist or that we may not be investigating an element of something of that nature and not yet seeing the scale of it. But at the moment, we haven't yet found a network on, of the extent that you've mentioned in Rotherham, Rochdale and elsewhere. The only thing I would add as well, October 2012 was the, the beginning of an operation, the Met called Operation Utri. Um, now, non-recent cases used to equate to probably two or three percent of my work on the child abuse teams. Um, that rose significantly at that point. Confidence rose. Obviously, that has led subsequently to, to national uh, inquiries in, into the, the phenomenon. It doesn't stop what we suspected may be a spike actually plateaued, and I think we're, we're there now. It's the new normal. Um, so that has a resource as well, because obviously non-recent historic investigations are at a different pace to the immediate safeguarding needs coming in over the, over the desk of the, of the DC as well. Um, it can be very, very labour intensive in terms of information going back 30, 40, 50 years into care homes, uh, partnership information, high in volume and very often in, in dusty cupboards. So it's, I, I think child protection in the Met in London, in any police force, is a convenient sort of title to give it, but it's so diverse. Uh, and I think, you know, between myself and Richard, we've probably described the main sources of, of, of that workload, and it, uh, it, it continues. I think it's the complexities and the diversities which we've heard about is, is the issue around the additionality on volume. Len, did you want to come in? I just want to go back to the dedicated ward officers and about how they would be tasked. So would that be on a, a weekly briefing or a monthly briefing or even a school liaison or link officer yeah. in terms of this work? How would it, how do you keep them in touch with current things, trends or specific issues that you might be briefing out on? How would that work at a borough level or in a merged borough issues? Is that left to local people who does it who's doing the tasking it is done locally um, if i talk about the borough where i last worked the dci uh, who was responsible for safeguarding um, which included domestic abuse um, hate crime etc uh, convened a weekly meeting to talk about the safeguarding issues wider so cse for example would have been part of that the children that were going missing the gang um, issues, the gangs team and the CSE investigators <coughs> were a single team and worked together because of some of the overlaps, not always an overlap there, but that weekly meeting of ward, what are we seeing, and then some of that would also go into a four weekly tasking more widely so that the whole of the borough would be aware of where we had particular people at risk or locations where we saw some of these, these things featuring. And is that the benchmark that we should be aiming across all of the borough commands at the moment for that because I you know one of the issues about the Met is getting consistency isn't it in yeah and I, I, I think there will be there will be a variety of approaches it was supported as well with a uh, three times a day a pace set a discussion of what was coming in so you've got that kind of drumbeat of activity if you like during the day um, the way the individual neighbourhood team inspectors would work would be to task their dedicated ward officers according to crimes that had come in, antisocial behaviour that had been reported, ongoing neighbourhood disputes, for example. What wasn't available then and is available now is our safe, safeguarding dashboard, which is in development. A lot of it's been built, um, but there are something like 150 requests for changes much of which relate to getting the data mapped down to ward level to enable a dedicated ward officer to very simply click down through and say, right, where are the safeguarding issues in my area before I go out? Um, we are in some of the areas of safeguarding. We've arrived and we've got that. There are others that are still being built into that system, but that means they can then self-brief and see what has come in and pick it up much easier than they could before where they were searching through databases. Thank you.
Thank you. We we'll move to our last set of questions. The this is about legislative change. That uh, the the Wood report in sixteen questioned and actually challenged the efficiency of the local safeguarding children's board. The government promised to introduce stronger, more flexible framework, and they're out consulting on proposals at the moment. We understand. Peter, you got some questions around this? Yes. Thank, thank you, Steve. Um, can I start with Grant? Maybe ask you. All. I mean, do you do you think? I mean, do you agree with the findings of the Wood report that the boards yes. are not effective? And if you do, I mean, in what ways are they ineffective? I think across um, London and the country. Um, um, local safeguarding children's boards, um, have, have, there's been a variance. Some have been um, really good and outstanding, and others um, have really struggled. And um, so I think it's right that there is a review of effectiveness, because particularly regarding partnership working, we're, we're all here to have better outcomes for children. So, um, so I think it, it, it's right that there's a review, and it's right that that review takes into account the changing local landscapes and other policy directions that are happening. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's always been a variance of good and outstanding and poor local safeguarding children's boards. I think what is really, really important in the, in the, in the recommendations or the, uh, the proposals that are coming forward is that the three key agencies of local authorities, CC, um, and uh, CCGs, and um, obviously um, uh, local authorities, CCGs, and um, Help me out, please. Yeah. Um, that that, that they, they have very, very strong partnership arrangements, good information sharing arrangements, and that what is included in that partnership is the wider work that those agencies do locally and pan-London. So it isn't the traditional model of, of groups of people sitting around um, a table, including all partners. It's, it's more of... Um, a collective ownership and understanding more broadly about what is contributing to keeping people safe across a wider system. So, um, so, so for, for, for me, that 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 is important. I think it, it um, you know, things change. Um, I think where we need to um, be clear um, is the voices of partner agencies that are currently represented around a table how we um, engage with those partners and how those partners feel that they have a voice and can contribute to um, local safeguarding um, matters locally. I think the other thing to say about those um, wood changes is that it's, it's going to be challenging because it, it, um, at the moment the local safeguarding children boards are on borough basis. Mm -hmm. In the future, of course, those arrangements may well not be. Um, mm -hmm. They may well be across two, three, four boroughs, depending on the local configurations. They may not be a, a assigned to what we would call in health um, sustainability and transformation um, partnership areas. They may well be outside of that. And so it makes that landscape uh, quite difficult to navigate. So I think that the leaders of the system are going to need to be um, very um, careful to ensure that, that um, the work that they are doing pulls together all of the partners in the area and that there is a clear um, governance around safeguarding to, to keep people, um, to keep children safe. Thank you. Um, Angela, can I ask you, would you, would you, what would you, would you agree with Wood similarly or, or what do you think of the, um, do you think that there, there are advantages to having this new more flexible localised approach? Or not? See, we, I come from a different sector because with coming from the provider sector, as I said, we, we work with 29 mm, yes. London boroughs, so we, we have mm. that experience. We provide services to them, um, and we have provision in seven of those London boroughs, so we work more closely with those seven London boroughs. But what we see is in certain sections of London, there is a real crossover between those boroughs. So I think it would be really helpful to have that flexibility um, to involve more than one partner borough in those arrangements. Um, I think there's real challenge around how that's going to be structured um, because there won't be overlaps in every single area of practice. Um, so certainly it gives an opportunity. Mm, yes. Um, Stephen, would you like to comment on this? I mean, you know, do you, I mean, the Wood Report was quite, quite damning and it seems that there is general um, agreement that 
a more flexible approach would be would be better. I, yeah, I, I mean, I I can only go from from my experience. I think it links in probably to the um, to the patchwork that Richard described earlier yeah. in in London. So I'll take the the example, uh, quite limited example of Section Eleven audits that um, that police are involved in uh, every periodic, periodically every couple of years. Um, now, it seems to me that there are some particularly effective LSCBs who don't just rest on the, on the audit, but mm. actually survey their staff as to uh, reality testing and, and finding out whether yeah. uh, what we're claiming in the audit is actually going on in reality. Um, I think there are some LSCBs potentially who are, who, who are missing the trick and have done for a, a while on that, um, and potentially has a sort of feel of marking your own homework mm. uh, from a police perspective, certainly. And say one thing about the 2016 HMIC, HMIC report, it has engendered a lot of pressure on the police, a lot of change uh, and a lot of work. And I think that out outside scrutiny is, is essential. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that some LSCBs uh, quite, so, quite grasp at the moment. I'll probably bring in Richard at that point. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the point is well made about the, the galvanising of focus that HMIC brought to us, but I would reflect that Ofsted did, invest, uh, did inspect local safeguarding boards, so there was the opportunity there through that inspectorate. I think the key here is around challenge, and Angela mentioned this earlier, about the real importance of constructive challenge between partners around child safeguarding. It's, it's vital that we have that. Um, I have valued um, having independent chairs on local safeguarding children boards where they work well for bringing that independence, for bringing that challenge. Um, I would be cautious about uh, a structure that didn't have that level of independence and had the three delivery agents holding each other to account. Um, now that could work extremely well, but just having an independent chair did add that element of challenge I, I think. Um, across London the majority of safeguarding boards I think inspected by Ofsted were found to be were found to be good mm -hmm. but there was that inconsistency across London which was identified um, by Ofsted and, and elsewhere. I think the ask from <coughs> policing this is enabling legislation to it, so it, it does let us look at opportunities around different geographies and different um, structures Again, the key for us will be some consistency of delivery, even if it's simple things, consistency of nomenclature. So rather than talking, calling the board something different in each borough clearly would be quite confusing for us when trying to engage. Um, you know, the adoption of London-wide protocols to stay in place so, so that we are all working to the same protocols. Um, and I think also looking at who else is invited to be part of that board. There are the three statutory partners, but I have often seen the value of having, for example, the charitable and voluntary sector present in some areas, uh, particularly where they're delivering some of the services. So I think some consistency and also to have a look at those um, local safeguarding children boards that worked well in London to see what could be learnt from those good examples as we go forward into this, this um, enabling period where other models might pick up. The geographic challenge is, yes, 32 borough base. Um, LSCBs is a challenge for all of us, but do we try and fit with five STPs or perhaps nine mental health trust areas or 12 potential police BCUs? How do we divide London up in a way that will, will work and has coterminous boundaries? I don't think that's possible, and therefore we, we have to accept there's an element of complexity in, in however we structure this. Anything to add, David? Um, yeah, just a couple of points. Um, I think it's interesting. I think what was in the uh, what's come out in the consultation document, and it's all obviously all wrapped up with uh, um, a, a bit of a review of working together to safeguard children in England as well. So it's it's almost a throwaway bit into that, which is very different to what I suspect Wood wanted when he did when the wholesale review was done. So I think it's quite probably important to reflect on that. It feels to me quite a downscaled um, look re look at it. I'm always worried about change because change breeds another, another period of um, disruption, of relationship building, all the things that we've been talking about over the course of the day, really. Um, I think there's a danger. And I think, actually, the Ofsted 
rating when it was going across LSCBs across England in general, the majority came out as good, which is kind of quite indicative of some positivity with working within it. There's nothing in the new suggested consultation that clarifies, for instance, anything around funding arrangements for LSCBs, which has always been a bone of contention. Um, because, and, and, and from my personal experience, often a, a disproportionate amount of time within board activity has been spent looking at that because it's, and, and the fact that the three statutory partners it still doesn't make any particular clear recommendations is not going to help those things to settle down. I think the point that Richard made about whatever happens in London, maintaining the London standards is absolutely critical because I think that, that has provided clarity um, around what goes forward. Um, I think that, that it will be absolutely critical that who, the chair and or the statutory partners consider the local landscape and make sure that the engagement of partners across um, you know, other provision is adequately, um, um, you know, provides an ad adequately occupied within those LSCPs. Thank you. Is it, is, it, is it right to say as a kind of broad picture that probably the Wood report's quite right nationally, but actually as it happens in London, these boards have worked quite well. Well, <laughs> well it's, it's, the, it's, it's the danger, isn't it, of trying yeah, to make yeah. a, of making a, a, wholesale, a wholesale change to something where in some places things are working very well. Yeah. And I mean, I think you point to my colleague said, some, some of the independent chairs have worked extremely well and extremely effectively and have galvanised those boards and they've, they've been strategic and they've had real clear priorities and some of them have not worked that well really. but. You know, there's always the problem with throwing the baby out with the bathwater, isn't it, when you do these kind of changes that you lose mm -hmm. the good bits and then you spend the next two or three two trees trying to re-establish and build relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for that. Is, and, and the detail and the time spent on this important subject was, was required. Um, I will certainly be writing to the Pathfinder Brothers um, about their uh, take on developments and improvements or, or otherwise. You'll be writing... Uh, to us um, around CSE figures, establishment figures, absentee figures uh, particularly. We have the Commissioner and the Deputy Mayor in front of us in a couple of weeks' time, and, and I've no doubt that on this subject we will have some questions around that from, <coughs> from them. Um, and obviously this group will continue uh, taking an interest in it, as will the HMIC, bearing in mind has come out this morning particularly around is there has been acknowledged some improvement but clearly uh, a lack of progress I think which has come out and I think that's something that we will focus on over the coming months on this work so thank you very much uh, for attending today and can I ask the committee to note the report on this subject and delegate any authority to me to agree any output um, on this on this work item seven can I ask the committee to agree our updated work program and delegate authority to me in consultation to agree the arrangements for a site visit to HM Prism Downview. The day of the next meeting, uh, which I touched upon, is Wednesday the 13th of December at 10 a.m. I have an, any other business on item 9, I shall read it. In accordance with section 100B of the Local Government Act 72, I am admitting to the agenda an item of urgent business namely request to delegate authority to me as chairman to agree the wording of a letter to the mayor regarding security issues arising from Brexit, which I mentioned earlier, in consultation with Group Leeds and Caroline Pigeon MBE. This matter has arisen since the agenda has been printed and the letter needs to be agreed. I will circulate that letter for your, your agreement in the next couple of days. If you're happy with that, you can look out for that. Thank you very much. And I'll thank you for bringing the meeting to an end. GLA Chamber